Hello again, and welcome to another edition of Doc Talk with Monument Health. My name is Mark Houston, and joining me again is Dr. Ali Zakaria, board certified gastroenterologist and hepatologist uh, physician, also trained in advanced interventional endoscopy. Today, um, and, I, and I first off, want to say thank you for the blue ribbon. I didn't know this was a thing yeah. uh, to start, but like there are pink ribbons for breast cancer, there are blue ribbons for colon cancer. Uh, and that's kind of what we're going to focus on today. Uh, and I know in a, in a future episode, we're also going to talk with your wife, who is an oncologist, mm-hmm. who also deals with this as well. Um, so you're the doctor, though, that we see first, right. correct? When something is just a little off or we feel like we should get checked, correct? Yeah. Can you, can you kind of take us through the, the process of how that works and, and yeah. what happens when you get a colonoscopy? Because I think... People, you only hear the jokes and the, and the yeah. you know, the, oh, I got 24 hours, I can't eat, I got to drink this horrible yeah. whatever, right? Um, honestly, I've had three of them in my life. I, I frankly enjoy the nap mm-hmm. when it happens, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so just to kind of reassure people that it's, it's an it's a extremely safe process yeah. that could save your life. Yeah, I want to actually step back one sure. uh, step here and, and, and talk about one important thing is that, you know, when... W- how do you present for colon cancer screening? Yes. Three categories. I look at it. Okay. Either you're absolutely asymptomatic, mm-hmm. you get to the age, or you have a high risk that you require to get a colonoscopy or a screening test for your colon cancer, or you come emergently to the ER with a bowel obstruction or massive bleeding, and it turned out to be a colon cancer, unfortunately, or in the middle group, mm-hmm. someone who has been having change in their bowel habits, their stool become very thin, um, they used to have regular bowel movements. Now they're getting more constipation. They start seeing some blood in the stool, discomfort or abdominal pain. Um, you know, mass. They feel a mass or feel like you know when they push or they wipe, they feel a mass in their rectum or something like that. So those are the things that is alarming that requires you know for, you know mm-hmm. for you to get more medical uh, attention. So those are the three categories. Okay. Either like asymptomatic, weird symptoms, or kind of symptoms that is you know could potentially link to colon cancer or acute emergent symptoms. And right. we've seen all of it, to be honest, in, in our community. Next is that why should I be, if I'm asymptomatic, why should I do screening? I mean, what am I getting out of the screening? I mean, there is enough data that it's actually colon cancer screening with either the studies actually were done on certain tests, and I will go into details when we talk about the tests that we have, but they actually reflected that to the other test, and we found that doing a screening for colorectal cancer is actually protective and improves mortality. So there is a mortality yeah. effect. So we know it works. So it's not, there is a benefit. Right. And we will talk about what is the benefit for certain, you know, certain tests in mm-hmm. general. Like, you know, some of them are screening to detect cancer or not while others can actually detect cancers and can detect precancerous lesions that we can actually remove for you not to get cancer. Is is there a way to find if, can can you detect colon cancer without colonoscopies? Yes. Is that possible? Yeah, and that's that's why the whole purpose of this is that you don't have to do colonoscopy for a screening. There's so many other tests that we can do, and and I will guide you and the audience and even the primary care physician how they should approach this. Sure. So the first thing that I would say that now, let's just talk about average person. We don't want to talk about high risk. We don't want to talk about, you know, uh, patients with symptoms. Mm -hmm. But if you get a symptoms, you go for, you know, medical attention and you will get, you know, the proper test offered. Because when you get symptoms, there is only one test that we should offer, which is basically endoscopic visualization with colonoscopy. If you are average risk or a patient who is 45 who wants to get screening for colon cancer, how this process will start. So the way that I look at it is that we look at the patient first and then try to triage them. Is this a low-risk patient? Is this a high-risk patient? And this should be started very early on in life. Patients or people, they disregard this, and even primary care physicians, they disregard this. When you have a patient at 20 year old who comes in for their annual physical exam, that's when you should start the process of screening for colon Mm -hmm. cancer. What you ask them, are they a high risk? Are they a low risk? Have they have any family history of colon cancer? Do they have any inflammatory bowel disease? Do they have any genetic predisposition? You will be surprised. Someone who was like 35 year old female who got, you know, breast cancer and then she did a genetic test and it came back as a certain genes that actually will be linked with colon cancer. So this patient, 
she came for breast cancer. Now she's going to be someone who's a high risk for colon cancer. Yeah. So you have to pay attention to that. And, 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 and you know, gladly we have a genetic counselor at Monument Health who has been doing phenomenal job, job with, with detecting those patients and send them uh, the proper way to get, you know, evaluated mm-hmm. for that. <clears throat> So as a primary care physician, when you get your patient for their annual physical exam, triage them, especially the young, you know, younger than 45. At 20, 30, every time they come in for their, their, for, for their annual physical exam, ask them, do you have a family history of colon cancer? Have your first degree relative ever got diagnosed with a high-risk adenoma? If those actually family members, your patient, you can review them. Oh, your dad just got a colonoscopy with a high-risk polyp. Right. You should start your screening at this point, or you mm-hmm. should see your gastroenterologist at this time so they can give you the proper recommendation how you should be screened. So triaging the patients early on in life will detect more of those patients. Once we get, okay, this is a high risk, go to your gastroenterologist, yeah. let's start the plan. Or you are an average risk, and you should start at the age of 45 because you're just an average risk, no symptoms, asymptomatic. At the age of 45, that patient comes in for his annual physical exam or for a visit with you, and that's when the shared decision-making should start. Mm -hmm. And the process goes this way. So you talk to the patient. Look at their values. How resistant are they for the screening? What is the barrier for them to do a screening test? Is it cost? Is it fineness? Is it, you know, time? Are they super busy? They cannot do it on a weekday because they work every day. Mm -hmm. They want to do it on a weekend. Um, They cannot go to a hospital. What is their values? What is the limitation? What is the barriers for them to do it? And work with the patient. I usually offer the patient one or two tests at a time. I don't offer them all the tests available because Mm -hmm. that's going to be confusing for them and confusing for you. So pick one or two tests that you believe in, you're comfortable with, and offer those two tests and go from there. Mm -hmm. And the way I will talk a little bit about the tests that we have available now, and then we will go in the process in yeah. each one of those tests. So the tests for colon cancer or the screening tests for colon cancer, I divide them into either stool-based, where you do a stool test, mm-hmm. or visualization of your colon, either by endoscopy or by imaging studies. So those are the three tests that we have. So, so the, stool st- the stool test or the stool-based studies, mm-hmm. we have the fecal immunochemical or testing or FET test, and, and this is an annual test. And this test will detect hemoglobin in, in stool, mm-hmm. and it's very sensitive to certain things in the stool. Mm-hmm. So that's an annual test. That's the most studied test, enough randomized trial that shows that it actually protected. It you know, helps mm-hmm. improving mortality. There is mortality benefit of doing this test. And it's actually a wide use test. There's actually countries where they only do that test annually. You come in, you get a FIT test. That's it. Every come, every annual physical exam, you get a FIT test. Mm-hmm. It's an annual test. You will get it, and that's it. Um, previously, we used to do a fecal occult blood test, which is basically you get cards, you do three consecutive right. stool samples on three stool, you know, bowel movements. You have to have certain bowel, you know, uh, food uh, changes alter- alteration in food, what you eat before it, so you don't get false positive. And, and it's still, it's part of the recommendation. Mm-hmm. We do a high sensitivity fecal occult blood test. I personally don't like to offer that test in general because it's, you know, it's patient dependent. You have to change your diet. If you don't, right. then there's a lot of counseling in it. I think the FIT test is a, is a more acceptable, easier test to do. And then re- we over, you know, Recently, I think 2015, we come we, we came up with a new stool-based test, which is the uh, uh, the DNA detection test or FIT multi-targeted uh, DNA test, and that test is actually a FIT test, which is the that detects hemoglobin, and also it detects DNA mutations in the stool. So it has a higher sensitivity, and the sensitivity comes actually from the FIT test, but also it can expand the frequency of doing the screening from one year to one to three years, like between one mm-hmm. every one to three years. Yeah. And usually we do it every three years. And this is like the blue box that patients know. It's, it's called Cologar. That's the, t- the, 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 the FDA-approved commercially available test okay. in, in, in USA. It's called Cologar. It's a blue box shipped to your place. And there is a very clear mm-hmm. instruction how to do it, how to put the stool sample. You ship it back, and then they will come back with a test. Positive, meaning that you have blood or mm-hmm. DNA detected, or negative, that is, there is no abnormality detected. So that's the stool-based test. Then, the in, you know, the visualization of the colon, either with colonoscopy, mm-hmm. which is we're going to talk a little bit in details about that in a minute, where you look inside the colon, detect if there is any mass or any colon cancer or a precancerous lesion like a polyp, and right. you remove it, or something we call it CT colonography, 
So it's a CT scan. You will do the prep. You will take, you know, the preparation for that. And then you do a CT scan that take a look at the colon. And then the radiologist will actually read it and detect if there is any polyp or mass or lesion. It needs expertise. It needs special preparation. We actually had it at Monument Health for some time, but then we stopped doing it because we can do colonoscopies. And it's, if it's positive, then you have to go to colonoscopy. Right. So we don't do it much, mm -hmm. but it is a valid test and it's, it's a test that we can offer. Mm -hmm. Another way of endoscopically visualizing the colon is flexible sigmoidoscopy, which is a shorter scope, we call it. We don't finish the whole thing. We don't go to the right side. So a colonoscopy does the whole, the whole colon. colon. From okay, the rectum got it. or from the anus all the way yep. to the cecum. That is a high-quality colonoscopy. Okay. <clears throat> Some patients will get a short colon or just looking at the left side of the colon. We call it flexible sigmoidoscopy. You can do it as a only test or you can you know, combine it with a fit test. So you can do an, you know, a fit test with, a, mm -hmm. you know, a flexible sigmoidoscopy. And there is a kind of like, you know, if, if uh, we can talk about the, you know, frequency of doing each one of them, as I right. said, you know, for the, for the annual fit test is yearly, for the Cologar test or the uh, multi-targeted DNA test is one to three years. We usually do it every three years. And then the flexible sigmoidoscopy every 10 years or every five years. Mm -hmm. It depends on which recommendation that you follow. Or you can combine them uh, with the fit test. I'm going to mention this here, and I want people to pay more attention to this because you will hear out there that there is a blood test for screening for colon cancer. There is two tests out there that is FDA-approved blood-based test, septin 9 and then the 7-gene mutation test. And those two tests... I want to actually just pay attention that we don't really recommend them as a screening test. You should not use them as screening because their screening threshold is not as good as we want it to be to actually have benefit. Right. So what those has been out there and, and we sometimes can use them to detect patients at a higher risk for colon cancer. Uh, like colon sanitary, that, that's the FDA, you know, the commercially approved FDA mm -hmm. test to look at patients who might be a higher risk. So that is the test that is out there, and I don't advise anyone to use those blood-based tests as a screening tool. They are not recommended. None of our societies actually put them in the guidelines as a recommended test. Actually, we recommend against using them for screening. So if you hear it on an advertisement or somewhere, TikTok, don't, don't follow that. <laughs> Glad you threw TikTok Yeah, there, yeah, yes. don't follow that. I mean, <laughs> okay. you know, listen to your medical professional right. and, 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 and listen to your doctors, you know, recommending the proper test for you. So those are the screening tests that we have. So mm -hmm. now when I sit with my patient during that decision-making mm -hmm. session, I will offer them. So you're 45, you're due for screening colonoscopy, your average risk. And right. when I say average risk, your risk of colon cancer and based on U.S. You know, studies is 4%. So we need to do a screening test. Mm -hmm. And I will offer them, do you, do you want a stool-based test or an or a colonoscopy. Right. I don't offer, oh, do you want, you know, CT, there is colonoscopy, there is a FIT test, there is Cologuard. The patient will get confused. Sure. So offer them one or two tests. Like, mm -hmm. do you want to do a FIT test or a colonoscopy? Or do you want to do a Cologuard or a colonoscopy? Just give them one or right. two. Just one <laughs> step approach or two step approach. If they say that, you know, oh, okay, so can you tell me more about this and that? So you will tell them the stool st test or the FET test is a stool-based test. You will get a card or you get yep. a test at home. You do the stool, you know, the bowel movement. You take a smear, you put it on the test, and that will give you the results. Mm -hmm. If you want to do the Cologuard or the multi-targeted DNA test, then you will get a box shipped to your uh, you know, home with instruction. Do it, and then you will get the results back, right. and it depends on that. If you want to do a colonoscopy, then we'll talk details about colonoscopy. Then it's a, you know, you mm -hmm. have to do a prep the day before. It's a procedure. And then they will, you know, you have to see a gastroenterologist. For right. It. The way that I mention things for the patient sometimes is that all the tests except the colonoscopy, if they come back abnormal, they will lead to a you colonoscopy. You have to have a colonoscopy, so right? So if you are someone who is absolutely against colonoscopy, we have to have that shared decision that, right. hey, if I do a stool test and it comes back positive, what are we going to do after that? So that's why, in general, gastroenterologists prefer to offer colonoscopy. Sure. Because, you know, I can detect precancerous lesions. I can detect polyps. I can remove them. If any other test is positive, it will lead to a colonoscopy. Right. And, and that's why we say that. Just get your colonoscopy. And if the colonoscopy is negative, you're good for 10 years. Why you would somebody be against having a colonoscopy? Like, what are some, what what are some reasons said. you've heard? That's what I said. There's a lot of barriers. Some people yeah. are like, you know, 
I'm a man. I'm not going to let anyone look oh, at that sure. area. Oh, sure. Okay. For example, yep. I hear that. Um, or I don't have time to do it on a weekday. Nobody offer it on a weekend. I just, it's not working for okay. me. Okay. Um, it's very expensive, though now, as a screening test, it's completely covered by your insurance. Right. You should get zero copay if you're yes. insured. Um, sometimes, like, I am not going to drink that prep. You know, I hear so many stories. I feel nauseated. Yeah. I start the prep. I'm vomiting. And we'll talk about the prep and sure. the advancement in that. Um, so the values, for example, I will, come, I will tell you, like, I'm from Middle East, right? Mm-hmm. I cannot tell you. Even my own family, I cannot convince them to do colonoscopy. They just screening. won't. Yeah. Oh, I mean, you know, we have, you know, religious background. Of course. We have, you know, mm-hmm. females who are wearing hijab and yep. they are, you know, covered. And they, it's it's a very sensitive topic for sure. them. Sure. So you have to have, like, the setup for them to see a female doctor, a female oh. pe- people in, 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 in the room. And at Monument, I promise you, we accommodate this. You know? Right. And my wife, my personal wife, mm-hmm. you know, we, we, if, if she needed colonoscopy, we can do all the setup. Or anyone who has certain religious belief or, you know, cultural right. uh, background, we are more than happy to accommodate them and, and provide mm-hmm. the care that they need. We can, you know, top privacy if they requested no males in the room yes. because of their beliefs. We yes. will do that. We will. We have female, you know, CRNAs or anesthesia providers, female providers, and then nurses and all of that. And we can, you know, do the best we have. Mm-hmm. We have a female gastroenterologist in down, and, and, and we work with her closely, and we can refer those patients to her to her as well. That's great. So, yeah, we want to work with them and, and, and respect their beliefs, their right. backgrounds, their culture, and whatever that makes them do the test. Mm-hmm, right. Because... I will tell you the message that I want to send today, and I'm loud and clear. The best test for screening for colon cancer is the test that the patient will do as instructed, no matter what that test is. So if you are an average risk patient and you want to do a screening test, do it as instructed, no matter what that test mm-hmm. is, excellent test. Right. Is it stool test? Is it cologuard? Is it you know CT colonography? Is it colonoscopy? All of them great if you do them as instructed. Perfect. If you don't follow instruction, then <laughs> right. that's, that's the problem. Yes. So once you offer those tests and then you talk about the risk and benefit of mm-hmm. each one of them, the cost, the, you know, the values and the shared decision, then you have to prepare them what is going to be next as a follow-up for positive test or right. abnormal test. So if you have a FIT test or you know, multi-targeted DNA or Cologuard test and that come back positive, you're going to go to colonoscopy. Mm-hmm. Don't repeat them. Some, some, you know, some providers have noticed that they will tend to repeat it. Don't do that. Right. Because if that second one comes back negative, are you going to tell him like, oh, maybe the first one is false positive, you're good to go. What if the second one is false negative? <laughs> right. Don't do that. <laughs> if you have a positive <clears throat> screening stool-based test, next is colonoscopy. Yes. Do not do anything else. You have to have a diagnostic test. And I will tell you the problem that we had in the past is that if you do a screening test like Cologuard test, mm-hmm. that com- comes, uh, you know, it comes back positive, then you do a colonoscopy. The CMS used to charge a patient copay for colonoscopy as diagnostic test, and that was not fair. Right. So gladly, you know, the the the, the societies pushed and pushed and pushed, and up until I think 2023, we get that covered under the spectrum of uh, screening process. Right. And if you have a positive stool-based test, you get a colonoscopy still consider as screening and you should not be charged any copays. Excellent. Yeah. So that's excellent kind of news right. and I'm it glad is. that this worked out because it's not fair for the patient. They sure. don't want to get, you know, colonoscopy, but then they get the need to do it. Yeah. And now it's become diagnostic because they got maybe what if the stool test was false positive? Right. I mean, it's not fair for them, right? Right. And we've seen that. The stool test can sure. be false positive. You can have a positive stool test and you do a high quality colonoscopy and it comes back negative. Mm-hmm. And those tests are actually good for colon cancer. They are not meant to detect any polyps, adenomas, or high-risk adenomas. Right. They can be positive with right. high-risk adenomas, but the screening sensitivity and, and specificity meant to detect colon cancer at early stage, hopefully. Mm-hmm. So now we talked about if a test comes positive, you need to go a colonoscopy. Another follow-up you have to set up expectation for, for is that what if you do a test? What is the follow-up if you do a test inappropriately or inadequately? Mm-hmm. Then if you do a FET test that was inadequate, you can repeat it. It was inadequate. Right. Don't repeat a test that gives a result. Mm-hmm. So if the results has been resulted or, and, and, and you can see it and it's positive, don't repeat it. Send to colonoscopy. <laughs> right. If the results comes back, this was an inadequate sample. We couldn't get a results for you or we cannot get a data for you. Then you can repeat that. Mm-hmm. Next is colonoscopy. 
So let's spend more time about colonoscopy. So you just came in to see me in my mm-hmm. office. We decided that we're going to proceed with the colonoscopy as your screening test. How that's going to go? So the day of the discussion, I will offer you some risk benefit of colonoscopy. Mm-hmm. We talked about the benefit, detecting early polyps, removing them, detecting cancer. It's diagnostic and could be potentially therapeutic. Mm-hmm. I can see things and I can remove them f- to prevent things. It's the only therapeutic procedure out of all of the screening process. Then we will talk about the risk of the procedure. There is a risk associated with anesthesia. There is a risk of sedation. I'm passing an instrument through your body. Mm -hmm. There's a risk of infection, perforation, bleeding, post-intervention complication. But the risk is low. So the risk of, and we got significantly better in our instruments. Now we have a extremely high definition scopes, you know, the, the, the stiffness, the, the, the way of, you know, dealing with the scope, the expertise, and, you know, having more people do- doing more procedures, it got significantly better. The risk of perforation is one in 10,000. And as much so, as I don't want to see those pictures, the pictures are amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they really are. I yeah, mean, yeah. they're... Now you they're, see, like, you know, images of what's going on. There's, right. like, you know, a way that you can tell the patient, this is what we found, this is what I see. Mm-hmm. And I actually... You just said that you had your, right. you know, yes. procedure, and I provided the images for you yes. to see because it visual kind of reinforcement helps a lot. It if does. If you see it, if you yes. get your, you know, report with you when you leave, it will tell you the story. Oh, what happened? Oh, oh that's the polyp. I've never seen a polyp. Right. What is this? How you removed it? You see how I kind of removed mm-hmm. it. So it's actually very helpful, and I get that feedback from a lot of patients. Yeah. So that's what I reinforce in our practice at Monument Health. So now this is the risk, very low risk. It's a very toler- tolerated procedure. I tell my patients, and maybe you heard me telling that, is that don't blame me for the night before the colonoscopy. Right. It's not my fault. <laughs> no, it's my nurse. <laughs> it's, 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 it's your fault. Right. It's someone else's fault. It's, it's not my fault. Exactly. Because the night, of, the night before the procedure is what patients actually complain about. Yeah, that is the biggest complaint. Yeah, which is basically you have to be on a special clear liquid diet mm-hmm. or something like that, which is actually the guidelines does not support in general. But we notice that if you are on... Low residue diet, you know, don't eat corn and come in for your right. colonoscopy. I'm going to see the corn in your colon, unfortunately. And this is like the biggest thing that I struggle with sometimes. Like, why did you eat corn yesterday? You just don't eat corn two days before colonoscopy. You're not going to digest that. So I tell them, like, you know, getting a low residue diet, especially, and we're not talking about patient who has chronic constipation, right. who get, you know, one bowel movement every five days. Those will require special attention and special diet recommendation or patient who has Parkinson, diabetes, mm-hmm. or chronic more comorbidities that actually will slow your colon. Those patients, we'll treat them a little bit differently. We do a two-day prep. We do a strict kind of instruction, but average risk. Someone who right. just, you know, 45, healthy, one bowel movement a day, no constipation. We say that just, you know, up until, you know, the breakfast of that day before the colonoscopy, take your, you know, regular diet. Yeah, and then right. at noontime, just low residue. Don't take something that cannot be digested. Mm-hmm. And then start the bowel prep. And the bowel prep is a spectrum. We got so much better now. Back in the days, the only thing that we had is a four, you know, right. a gallon of four liters of go lightly or new lightly or polyethylene glycol, you know, based, you know, laxative. Yes. And you really, really have to drink it all over the night, mm-hmm. and you have to finish it the day before. Then we got more new upgraded or updated, you know, bowel prep, which is a smaller volume, yep. and it, 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 it actually get you, you know, less volume, and it's more tolerable. Mm-hmm. And then we work into more bowel prep that has a little bit better taste. Patient, they yes. say that, oh, it tastes something <laughs> that I can actually taste. It's right. not something addition that we add to that go lightly. So, you know, like this actually also helped. And then we get into actually tablets. Mm-hmm. Now we can get tablets, like pills really? that you take and you drink a lot of fluids or a lot of water after it, and that works as well. So we got significantly better from yeah. like a gallon to tablets <laughs> with a lot of water. One thing that I know that a lot of people, they use Merilax or polyethylene glycol yes. over the counter with Gatorade or some hydration solution, and they mix it and they take it. I personally don't do that through our clinic, not to be difficult, mm-hmm. but those are not FDA approved for that particular oh, reason. I see. And there is th- those are not truly balanced. So the go lightly or the or the polyethylene glycol gallon, new lightly, go lightly, all of these generic names, those are actually well calculated to maintain certain volume and certain electrolytes, you know, and and and, and avoid any complication. Yeah. Merilax and Gatorade, not calculated properly to prevent any complication from you know dehydration mm-hmm. with the prep or something like that. People they like it because it tastes well. You're, you're drinking Gatorade basically. Right. 
Um, I don't do that through my office, but again, it's not me being difficult. It's not me being trying to do the best for the patients sure. if I can. And again, there's a lot of practice out there who uses it and big institutions and, and I'm, I'm, you know, right. I'm okay exactly. with that. Yes. But, you know, I just try to do the best uh, uh, that I can for our patients and follow some FDA kind of uh, guided uh, recommendations. So, yeah, the problem with the prep, why we don't use the tablets, why we don't do use like those tasty mm-hmm. prep, they're expensive. Yeah, there's new, expensive, fancy. So sometimes the insurers won't cover them. So you're talking about, you know, go lightly. It's covered by your insurance. Mm-hmm. It's maybe zero cost, maybe one, two dollars, if any. And then you go to those newer preps that can be up to two hundred dollars. So patient is like, well, if I'm going to pay two hundred dollars for this and if I'm doing diagnostic colonoscopy, it's going to be a copay. It's going to be a lot of cost that comes with it. Yeah, we have some coupon programs that we work with our clinic that they get that for you if possible to cut it down to $50 or $40 or $35 or something affordable. Mm-hmm. And if the patient is interested, then we will all about it. We will sure. offer it. We're not going to force the patient to take one of them. We will offer them and get the best for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, some of them associated with a better outcome in, in general, like a cleaner corner. Right. Again, I say that again, and it's clean, that the best prep is actually the prep that you take as yes. instructed. If you take your prep as instructed, I'm going to have a clean colon and I'm going to be able to see everything. Because the worst thing that can happen, you don't follow our instruction, you come into your colonoscopy, and I go in and I see a lot of stool. Right. I'm going to tell you, you're going to you're going to get your colonoscopy repeated because yeah. I'm not going to give you a recommendation for 10 years if I haven't seen everything as a high quality on you know colonoscopy. And I'm going to talk about what high quality means in in, in a minute. Mm-hmm. So please take your colonoscopy <laughs> prep as instructed <laughs> yes, and yeah, bear with to. us. You right. know? And if you want a smaller volume requested when they mm-hmm. call you to schedule and they will tell you the price and if it's something that you can afford, then we will be more than happy to work with you to get that you know, prep uh, prescribed. And then you get that colonoscopy prep. Back in the days, you used to drink it, all of it, the night before. Right. We mm-hmm. found that actually if we split the prep, half of it the night before and half of it early in the morning and it's a little bit early it is early yeah boy it depends and i I usually (laughs) let me tell you i usually do this for my patient it depends when is your colonoscopy if your colonoscopy you need to be fasting four hours before your colonoscopy so it has you have to finish the second half of the prep at least four to six hours before your colonoscopy Mm -hmm. so if your colonoscopy at 7 a.m sorry yep Yep. you're You're, you're up at four you're up at two yeah if your colonoscopy (laughs) at 12 a.m then you carry your up at five and you finish it and then you come in if your colonoscopy at 3 p.m., then you're going to finish it at 7 a.m. So right. that shouldn't be bad. So if you're someone who's like, I'm not going to wake up at the middle of the night. They, I will tell them I did it, but I'm not going to do it. Right. Just schedule your colonoscopy mm-hmm. later in the day yeah. and finish it six hours before. So you wake up at 5, you finish it at 8, you come in for your colonoscopy, everyone's happy. Yes. So that's like how we do the split prep. And we found actually it's a better way of doing it. And it, actually there are certain areas where they do, I don't want to mention countries mm-hmm. or other places, where actually they bring the patient to their endoscopy unit they will have a bed and a bathroom, and the patient will prep same day right before there. their colonoscopy. And they will just keep drinking the prep up until they clean, and they get the colonoscopy to ensure that it's a high-quality prep that makes the endoscopist see everything and do the procedure safely. Right. Because if the, if the prep is poor, the higher risk of complication, the higher yeah. risk of perforation, the higher risk of missing lesions mm-hmm. or not being able to remove a lesion because I'm concerned that I might cause a perforation, and then that will lead a significant poor outcome right so that's how the prep goes so you finish your prep you enjoy the day in the bathroom Mm -hmm. (laughs) and then you come in in the morning you will meet your endoscopist in the Mm pre-procedural area they will get you prepped they get your vital signs Mm -hmm. they will put you at ease i usually try to kind of like make a little bit of you know jokes with the patient of to take their stress and anxiety and kind of blame the nurse or someone else (laughs) for the prep and the the night and they'll seem like you will have an excellent night excellent nap Pick up a nice place, dream off, we we'll yes. see you there. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it's a very well-tolerated, safe procedure. You will wake up before you feel it and, and you mm-hmm. know, we'll start the process. You will be asleep. Yep. Now we have a better anesthesia kind of care. At Monument Health, we only do colonoscopy under, under monitored anesthesia care. Mm-hmm. So there will be anesthesiologists who will m- meet with the patient and there will be a, uh, you know, professional uh, right. CRNA or, you know, certified nurse uh, anesthetist in the room. They will monitor the patient. They will provide the medication that will put him asleep or put the patient asleep. Mm-hmm. And they, we don't start until they are 
fully comfortable and sleeping. We start the procedure and then they will wake up after the procedure like this. Yeah. You know, a few minutes they wake up, oh, I'm done. Mm-hmm. They're like surprised and everyone has mostly a smile on their face because it's very tolerated procedure. It is. Completely. And then, you know, I usually meet the patient after the procedure. I give them the report, tell them this is what we've done. This is what we have. Mm-hmm. If everything clean, no polyps, no legions, no mass, I will them like you got a 10 year warranty. Yeah. So you will see you in 10 <laughs> years Un- unless something happens in that mm-hmm. 10 year. You change the bowel habits, symptoms, family right. member who come <laughs> with a diagnosis of cancer or advanced polyp, then that's the annual physical exam role of the primary care physician. So this is my message to them. Even if I send that this patient is 10 year, it doesn't mean that it is 10 years. Right. Things change. Mm-hmm. Make sure that you talk to your patients and update their family history annually. That's what we do, the annual physical exam or the Medicare wellness exam or those medical right. e- or annual visits with the primary care because they will see the patient. I'm not going to see the patient again for a screen colonoscopy if everything is normal and they mm-hmm. have no complaint. So, And then if there is any pathology, I will let the patient know that I send the pathology to the pathologist. Mm-hmm. They will get back to me. And based on the pathology, we will talk about what is going to be next. And the pathology can be valuable. It can be an adenoma. It can be adenoma with high-risk features. And it can be, you know, the less adenoma or it can be a cancer. And then we will take it from there. The new kid in the block is something we call it sessile serrated lesion. So people might start seeing this in their report. And they will be, okay, what is sessile serrated lesion? It's an, a new type of polyps that based on a certain mutations. And we've noticed that those are difficult to detect. Less frequent, but difficult to detect. They come as a flat lesion. Very difficult, and, and, and our detection rate is not as good as the adenomas. But those comes as on the right side, faster, you know, sometimes slow growing, but sometimes can become cancer right away. They, we notice that they might be a cause of interval cancer as well because we don't see them, and then they grow, and we don't see them again. Right. So there's, the, 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 you know, a, special, a specialized gastroenterologist now are more aware of this. They will pay attention to the signs of potential polyp in that area, and we will remove those polyps. Um, and there was like, you know, quality metrics of high quality colonoscopy. Mm-hmm. And I will talk about that now because, you know, now you got your colonoscopy. How do you know that you get a high quality colonoscopy? Right. How do you believe that, oh, my physician did the best that he can do? So in general, we say a high quality colonoscopy is the colonoscopy that reach all the way to the right side or the cecum or the end of the colon. And then a high quality colonoscopy is a colonoscopy that shows all the mucosa and the bowel prep is adequate mm-hmm. to see any polyp more than six millimeter. So that's why the bowel prep is very important. So I can get to a high-quality colonoscopy. A high-quality colonoscopy is a colonoscopy that you look into the right side twice. Forward, you go into the end, you pull back, and then you go back again a second time to look and make sure that we're not missing those cisacerated lesions. Or you can actually flip the scope back in the right side and look backward. So that's something that if you look at your colonoscopy report, you will see me mentioning that retroflexion in the right side of the colon has been performed. And I look backward, and then I advance, and I actually do a backward and forward look twice just to make sure that I'm not missing anything. Um, You don't have to do that, but at least you have to do either two forward uh, views or one forward and one retroflex view. And then the high quality is the one that, you know, take images of, landmark mm-hmm. like cecum or the the right side of the colon the rectum the appendiceal orifice or the appendix opening um and then you know if you if if you are an endoscopist you should have a certain quality metrics in terms of how much you detect polyps and this is a very challenging process because you know there is a term we call it adenoma detection rate how good you in detecting adenomas mm-hmm. but that's not fair because what if you detect one polyp in a screening colonoscopy, that will give you that check for adenoma detection rate, but maybe you missed five polyps. (laughs) Sure. So now we're looking at a polyp per colonoscopy detection rate or polyp detection rate. So there's a lot of work happening behind the scene from the big societies about improving our quality metrics. But in general, you should look at an endoscopist for their adenoma detection rate on average more than 25%. 30% for male, 20% for females, but average is more than 25%. Mm -hmm. Uh, if their adenoma detection rate is less than 25%, then they need actually supervision. They need more training sure. to get their adenoma detection rate into a better kind of you know, situation where right. they can actually offer a high-quality colonoscopy. Excellent. So those are like the general rules that we talk about, you know, high-quality mm-hmm. colonoscopy. And if you get a high-quality colonoscopy with no polyps detected and you are an average-risk patient, 
then you're good for 10 years. Excellent. If you someone who has polyps, mm-hmm. and this is also mm-hmm. a changing process. So back in the days, for example, if you have one or two tubular adenomas, low risk, no high risk features, the recommendation used to be five to 10 years. Right. Now, we actually updated the recommendation in 2021 to reflect that those are very low risk. They're not going to grow up fast. And you can do surveillance for one to two small tubular adenomas in an average risk, high quality colonoscopy in seven to 10 years. And I will tell you, there's a lot of resistance from, you know, gastroenterologists, especially who used to the old guidelines Mm -hmm. to change. And we keep you know, counseling them, like, you get a change. This is not based on five, six patients. This is based on a huge studies yeah. and, you know, extreme experts in the field that, you know, recommended this. And, 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 and this is like a guideline recommendation. So, again, all comes back to the benefit and risk. Right. What if you bring the patient in five years and do the procedure and then, God forbid, you get a complication? I mean, you brought the patient a little bit earlier. You could have waited, you know. Mm-hmm. Maybe that complication will happen either or. So, I always look at the risk and benefit. And, and I pretty respect our guidelines. Our, those are robust and, and well-studied, well-done. A lot of experts come in and present those you know, studies. So my, my, my practice has changed. I follow up the new guidelines. If there is you know, low risk, too small, one small adenoma, you got four, seven to 10 years, right. seven years, 10 years. I usually get the shorter one. So right. patients will feel comfortable because you tell them like, you have a polyp, but I'm gonna bring you as, as, as 10 years. Well, what if I get another polyp? What if I get this? So things change in t- in patients who has three to four polyps. It's you know uh, you know the duration will get longer. Mm-hmm. If you have more polyps, like if let's say that I get a, a patient with ten polyps in one colonoscopy, that's a different story. Then right. Those are a high risk that you need to look into counseling them about genetic studies and genetic testing, or patient who accumulated more than ten adenomas or twenty adenomas in their life over multiple colonoscopies that put them at a higher risk. They need more counseling, genetic studies, more frequent colonoscopy. Or if someone who has a high risk adenoma, more than 10 millimeter or high grade dysplasia or you know villous features, those are someone that we'll bring sooner. Sometimes I do a high risk interventional procedure, as I said, I see a huge polyp. Back in the days, we used to send two centimeter polyps to surgery for hemocolectomy. We don't do that anymore. You know, I can remove 10, 20 centimeter polyp as big as it can we can still remove it endoscopically without surgery and and the patient can go home same day mm-hmm. but we want to make sure that you really understand those big polyps and you can you know examine them well and make sure that th- those are not cancerous polyps. right we don't remove cancerous polyps endoscopically those needs to go to surgery mm-hmm. except few exceptions mm-hmm. we can talk about but in general even big polyps nowadays we can remove them endoscopically and you can go home same day and then right. we just increase your surveillance because if i remove that in small pieces then the risk of recurrence is high then we may we might need to bring you in six to twelve months mm-hmm. if we remove it in block as one piece and maybe three years so it depends on what we do and that's why i don't want to go into details that right. takes like you know right. hours to talk into it but in general this is like my impression about how you you know target patients and how they counsel them and then how you talk to them after you get the pathology so the best recommendation should come after you review the pathology their risk factors their you know risk status right and then you provide the recommendation if someone comes in after your colonoscopy tells you that oh you got three polyps you're screening in three years Question that. <laughs> wait for the pathology. Yeah. Confirm sure. that those are, you know, polyps that you should right. wait for three years or someone should wait for five years or is it seven years or all of this benign I should go for 10 years. Right. Well, doctor, um, I think if anybody has listened to this podcast and has any questions, I would be very surprised. OK, <laughs> you have done an excellent job of explaining all of this right now. And of course, the main thing to take away from this today for sure is get screened yeah right the best test is the test that you do as instructed that is great advice i keep telling my wife and i'm going to say it one more time is that if you see me you're not going to see her hopefully (laughs) so see me so you don't see her she's a cancer doctor if you know what you don't want to see a cancer doctor come and see us or see your primary care to do a screen (laughs) of course (laughs) (laughs) dr aliza karia thank you so much for coming in and talking again you're welcome anytime thank you so much thank you appreciate it